I think what I'll do now is I will do a proper introduction to Jarl Pettersson, who's come all the way from Norway and who has a <coughs> company in Norse Wax, Ecovax, who <coughs> produce the wax that we're talking about and who I've been working closely with Christie's Elite for a number of years now and I want to give you to give him a huge welcome because he's made a massive effort to get here today and I'm really pleased that he and his lovely daughter Marie are here today. Okay? Thank you. I'm very glad to be here, uh, first of all because uh, this was an exciting meeting to, to travel to because uh, I know Rachel and I thought that uh, she had a lot of energy. So uh, this is a meeting with energy with not a strong agenda. I have been to many meetings with uh, dressed people where the agenda is set but uh, here we will just present what's going on. And uh, first of all, uh, my, our company Norsk Wax has been uh, working on the problem with the Hilobius since 1992. And it was really been, uh, it's been very interesting because you, uh, there are so many things you have to do correctly to, to, to be friends with this uh, insect. So it doesn't destroy your plants. And, uh, and there have been ups and downs and uh, a lot of things. And, uh, Really, I gave up in 2008. I, I cannot, I, can, I don't have the energy to do anything more. But then the market came to me and they said, we have to do something in Sweden. Come to us, come to us. And, and then the, the big forest giants in Sweden started to work and decided to go for alternatives in 2009. <coughs> And, and then uh, things turned a little upwards because you have to have a market to talk to. You have to have people who are interested in what you're doing. It's not only to be interested in yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I will also fill in that I was not only myself. I have worked all the time with the University of Oslo. With Aud Bergen Eriksen, who is now a, a professor emeritus. She's been working with me since 2000. And, and we have created a lot of interesting things, we believe. The situation today is that uh, from today until October, we are shipping out 220 tons of wax to Sweden, to Denmark, to Latvia, to Estonia, to most of the countries. Can you translate that 220 tons of wax into... I think it's about 20 million trees in Sweden every year, and so now it's about 5 million, 6 million in Norway, rapidly growing in Norway. Because the Norwegian forest people, the harvester, Viken Skog, for example, uh, see good results. We can do forestry with this in Scandinavia. And uh, what we thought was a very good solution is maybe something we only thought. Because when you compare, you follow, you study, and you have to study one merit forest plant, or 100 merit forest plant, 100 wax plants, and you have to compare and do the details. <coughs> and then you see in the end that it's statistically better. It doesn't mean that the life is better for the nursery people because uh, one of them <coughs> once said to me that yeah, you don't make my life easier for the nursery man. Because a nursery man has an easy life when he can spray water-based chemicals. It's simple to do and he can make a margin. When he has to apply a layer, correctly thick and correct part of the plant, on one and one plant, for example, and he has 10 million plants. He doesn't have an easy day. So we understand that. So, but the reason it started in Sweden, as I understand, is that somebody has, it wouldn't, won't be the nurseryman who starts this. There must be somebody who has a higher vision. And in Sweden, it was a FSC organization <laughs> together with the forest gi giants. He said, we have to do something to keep the certificates. And today, uh, we do at least 50% of the insecticides in Sweden is substituted by, by uh, alternatives, wax and others. I will speak about only the wax. And, uh, and it's taking more and more share of, of the market. I think wax is 20% of the Swedish alternatives. So now, uh, what I will do now is uh, I will take you through a little background of the wax why we do wax and, and it has been done rather seriously 
Then later on, I will sh at the end, I will show some trialing we are doing in Rotes with wax. We have some results. We have been measuring this uh, plants there latest yesterday. Okay. So I think it's uh, just to show that, as I've said, we are struggling and struggling uh, and learn and learn, and we still learn. Uh, so I'll take you through uh, about 20 minutes, I think, with, uh, with uh, a, a 20 minutes of a 2.3 million euro project. That means that uh, what happened was that we had been doing uh, some errors, but some success also, until 90, 2012. Then somebody said, let's write an application, let's make a consortium. And this consortium wrote an application to the EU system, to the Framework 7 program. And say we want to do a project on wax uh, in, in order to change the water spring uh, systems to a wax uh, alternative. <coughs> the members of this, uh, of this project were from uh, uh, Sweden. Estonia, Latvia, uh, we had uh, Norway, Italy, Finland. 15 people I think we were on total. And we had a lot of interesting <coughs> things, we learned a lot together and we achieved some results. The target was to explain how the plant, has, how the biology of the plant is in the context of the wax and how the insect reacts on the wax the plant. And then we had to make application equipment for the nursery. This is only a picture of the group. It was from 2012-2015, and there, I think there are a lot of stuff on the internet called wewillstop.com. And the background was that we have this uh, insect, which we all know, I presume, which spread, and I do, I do think it may be also increased in number. <coughs> and we knew that uh, the problem was very significant, that 80% of the serine die in Sweden, if we don't do anything in the south, is the product is less, less severe in the north. But still doing uh, protection, we still have a loss of 10 to 40 percent. <coughs> the damage loss in Europe, in, in, uh, when we investigated the figures, was 100 million euro potential loss. There is, in, in 2000, these are little old figures, but uh, this is from 2012. There was uh, 1 billion plants, uh, conifers in EU, and 40% with insecticides. So the, there was a large use of insecticides. The alternatives to the insecticides is to protect physically the plant, either by a, like a, a sleep or by a coating. And today I think most go for coatings. There's a lot of different coatings, of course. A wax is one. Well. So, what happened? Because people ask, put question marks, and you can, you can kill a plant with wax. It's pretty easy. You know, it's 80 degrees Celsius, it's very warm, relatively warm, and the plant has a maximum tolerance of 55 degrees. So that means you have to see what happens with the energy which you have in the wax when it hits the plant. Today we are rather, uh, have a lot of background material on that, and we know how to do. But I say you have to do it correctly. I think in the beginning, let's say before this, that we did some errors in the cooling system. We did kill some plants without knowing it, with high temperatures. But I, I could talk a lot about just that, but I won't do it. But uh, we know how to handle it today. Uh, because what we did, which is just to show how we worked, we worked three years with the University of Oslo, with Albert and Eriksen, Anne Wolsnes, and they uh, 100, 100 full time, three years. We started with uh, sorting plants, uh, containerized plants. We choose to work with containerized plants from Bergvik in Sweden. We sorted them to uh, smaller plants, which were, uh, I think it was 18 centimeters, and next group was 23 centimeters and 28 centimeters. We had three different sizes. Then we decided to uh, treat them with different layers, height of wax, to cover di di uh, different percentages of the plant with, uh, with the wax, to see how much green mass we needed to have a good biology. Then we treated it with one layer, two layers, three layers, because they have a different thickness and different, different temperature burden on the plant. 
So all this we did. And what we found was that uh, you cannot cover a plant totally because if you have a plant which is 80 centimeters and you treat it with 20 centimeters of wax, there is no green mass. So the green mass, uh, that plant would soften a little. So as we see here. <coughs> but most of the other plants will, 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 will survive to some uh, extent, uh, but maybe sometimes it's set back in production of new uh, green mass and, and set back on uh, the rooting, we call it the rooting index, how good they root. <coughs> I will show you the result a little later. Then at the same plants, we said, what, how do the weevil react on these different plants? We have different uh, height of wax on the plant, we have different thickness of, of the wax. We put them into, we set up the University of Sweden, and they put them into two compartments where they had uh, four weavers and one plant in each, and there were some hundreds of them. To see what is the requirement on the wax to protect. So now, from this, we can learn what is, uh, what is how do you need to apply the wax to make the plant healthy, and how do you need to, to treat the wax, how to apply the wax to keep it safe from the insect? <coughs> Two questions we had to answer. This is uh, rather important for us. This is what we go around to all the nurseries today and say, you have to look at this figure because in these tubes in the University of Sweden where we had these four insects and the plant, we found that if I had only wax it one time, I had 0.6 meter, 0.6 millimeter thick wax layer. We found that uh, that was a little too thin. If I waxed it two times, I had one millimeter, and there was a significant difference. And if I had uh, three layers, I had 1.3 millimeters. You see, after two days, this is red is the number of attacks, how much it was attacked. That the 0.6 millimeter thin layer was attacked to this high, this high attack, but the, the, the thick layer protected the plant. It took a long time before that it was attacked. And this is not only the figure for the two first days, and the four next days, and seven days, and after 11 days, uh, that attack was uh, severe, severe on, on, on the thin layer. That means that the wax layer, the coating you apply, has to have a certain thickness. We call it a hockey stick effect. And many times we see it today already, also today, of users of wax that they are too thin because, oh, they complain that there's an attack on that plant, and we say it's too thin. We know that from, from the research. Probably the effect is that there's two effects from the wax. The one is how to identify the plant. The nose of the insect maybe has probably identifying that there's a plant underneath if it's thicker layer. And then there's another effect that it's difficult to go through with a, with a, with a, with a, with a small mouth. Part of the research also, just to give you the background, that uh, we took a, a stick of pine with one layer of wax and a stick of pine with two layer of wax, put them into a small beaker with some insect, see, film them some days to see where do they, would, where do they stay. And again, the same result. A thicker layer, they stay 50% shorter time on the thicker layer because they don't identify the, the pine. And if you, the crack is of course a little important. If you put a little scratch in, the, in that pine, they stick the nose into that uh, hole. The, all this is background things to make the nursery man do the right things. Mm -hmm. The recommendation. Then also we did, uh, now we come to the biology. We had uh, covered them with different height of wax and we want to see how we measured how the root grows, uh, how they develop the roots. <coughs> and then we find that uh, covering the green part with wax takes down the green mass, uh, reduces uh, root growth capacity. And uh, on a small plant, if I if I have no wax, I have index 5, which is the normal good index for a root growth. If I cover the whole plant where there is no, uh, nothing left of, uh, of green mass, I have 1.5. Of course, they're totally covered. And 
in, in, a, in, in a parenthesis here, we say that this, the O points out the, the zero centimeter green. This is three centimeter green pass because it's 50 centimeter and and uh, uh, no wax, 50 centimeter wax and, and three centimeter of color. So the logic comes out here. If you if you have a 8, 28 centimeter green mass, everything green mass, you get high rooting index. If you have no green mass, you get low rooting index, and you have to find where how much can I cover? Do you have an acceptable for uh, establishing in the plantation. And it comes out, the, the, the recommendation is you have to have not maximum 70% of the plant covered. To have, you get some reduced uh, routine capacity, you will go to the index around four, from five to four. But that's acceptable, it will, it will establish. Also the same you can see uh, from the uh, shoot lengths, the shoot length is also covered by covering the green mass with wax. And also here the recommendation would be that you can cover 60% of the, of the green mass with wax and have 40% uncovered uh, and it will establish okay. Uh, in practice, we say that wax thickness, how does it look when you have a thin layer of wax and a thick layer of wax? We want a, a layer that is not too much cracked because the, 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 the pine weaver will find the plant easier if they're cracked. It doesn't mean that it necessarily eat ring marks, but it can find the way where there's a plant. So here you see uh, when you have a thin wax layer and a thick wax layer, they are grown in a, in a phytotrome, uh, similar to three years of growth, I think. We see that uh, the thin wax, of course, is not able to stretch because the plant grows in diameter, 100 to 100 percent, and it, uh, the, thin, the wax layer will, of course, be thinner and thinner and thinner. In the end, it will break. So again, uh, this uh, this is just to show that the thickness of the, of the wax layer is important. Again, it is how you do the method is important, like everything, but it, particularly when you do coatings. Then the university <coughs> people uh, said, now we know the height should be as high as, mm, we should, uh, the thicker the better wax, uh, the, the better protection, the, the higher, and the, and the low, low, if you have a low part of the plant, high, 10 centimeter plant or 15 centimeter plant, will that affect how it's, uh, how it's, uh, um, it's how the insect is uh, attacking the plant. So we did a practical, Plantation to see if the, the theoretical thing from the from this uh, laboratory experiments uh, worked in practice. So we went out to a southern part of Norway uh, where we have uh, on the coastline of Norway we have the hardest attack of insects because we don't have so much frost from the beyond the sea to keep the temperature medium higher. And and then we had a, a very difficult area uh, and we said we plant uh, plants with a different. Uh, wax thickness and it's a, I'm sorry it's actually Norwegian I was uh, I don't only have this uh, Norwegian uh, slide but uh, it says really that when I have uh, a wax layer with this uh, one layer this is the one this is a one layer and this is the percent of the plants which are cracked and this is two layers so we see that we again uh, get the same effect in, in real nature that we got in the laboratory, uh, thicker layers, cracks less. And all the top shoots were okay, because we had covered not more than 50 but 60 percent of the plant with wax. <coughs> and of course, there was, I, I won't show too many of these protection uh, data, because they can vary a lot with the different places, but <coughs> it shows uh, that the control, which is without wax, this was 80 percent uh, injured on the stem. End of summer. One one layer, high 10 centimeters, uh, strong reduction 10 percent. But if I continue to, if I go higher, and uh, if I even go higher and thicker, I get uh, full protection. 
So again, as this guy, how much can you cover with the wax? I would like to cover the whole plant, but that keeps on green mass because you want rooting index and you want top shoot. Then I want to show uh, why uh, wax become very interesting in Norway because we did a plantation uh, 2015 and uh, we did a normal merit forest treatment which is normal in Norway and then we did uh, a wax covering in nursery. Following the book. Planted it in a very severe uh, area in Norway with high, high pine needle close to the coast and then we find that the living seedlings, uh, first year, we had only 20% living control. We had only 40% bed forest, and we had 90% for fire living wax. That made the nursery business interesting. And that made some of the people in planting interested. And we, I don't, I mean, there's a lot of uh, <laughs> results uh, since that, which clearly show that wax is better than many forest. Because we, in Norway, we plant, we do the treatment with the many forest in the nursery, and we are not allowed to spray it in, in, outside. We need never do uh, uh, soil scarification. We plant directly into raw soil. And we maybe have some rain. So maybe the many forest, it was a wet summer, so maybe they, they just rained off. But it's not that summer. We haven't had that since. We are still running official trials in Norway which is in favor of wax to many forests on performance. And then we have to come to the application part because uh, somebody first, <coughs> thick layer of wax up to maximum 70% of the plant time <coughs> and third point cooling. Okay, the wax machine uh, problem is that there are so many shapes of these plants. These are a lot of bearers plants. And we have all of these uh, containerized plants, uh, which are a little easier maybe to handle because they are more even shape. And I always say that c uh, spraying is spraying uh, water-based, but coating is precise coating. You have to coat correctly the plant. So this is more, a little more complicated for the nursery man. <coughs> So we developed an automatic machine, again in this AU project, financed by the AU. And uh, it is uh, the principle we found, we studied a lot of different principles, how to get the wax onto the plant. And we of course had uh, some background also from all the projects. But we ended up with something uh, I found very interesting. A wax machine in the nursery has to be a little rough, rough type. Machine has to stand some environmental, some dirt, the soil. A wax when you run a wax machine uh, with nursery plants, you get wax plants, a lot of soil, and a lot of needles. They come together in a big mix. So it, it cannot be a fine-tuned thing. It must be rough principles. And I like this machine. So we, we, because we fill them in, the, in, one by one, we can take them up with a pick and place unit from the containers. We only work, in this case, on the containers in this project. We, we can take them up with a pick and place and place them in cups one by one. Uh, there, is a, there is a conveyor belt as it goes round and around. One place you take them out, the plants, and one place you fill them in. Then you have a screw, which is the original thing. You have a, you have a screw, and, 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 and this screw, uh, the, the trays, I'm sure we have film soon, but the trays come down in the horizontal direction. And there's a shower, a, a reasonably coarse shower, not nozzles which clog with everything. Mm -hmm. Good holes from shower with wax. You go through there, and then you go into another shower with water. Simple, not complicated, rough, works. And, and then we have treated plants down to this size. The smallest we have treated is very, very small spruce. But eight is on the, on the limit what we would like to do because the temperature of the wax. But I mean, this is on the show that we have done smaller plants. And, but a, a 20 centimeter container plant is a beautiful plant to treat. That's easy. This can be a little small. Yeah, just a few words, what, we, we, what our recommendation things. As we said, the simple way 
you have to have a protective layer, and the protective layer is uh, around one millimeter. We prefer we 0.8. We we we, ex we understand the nursery man. He wants to save some money <laughs> using less wax, but but okay, 0.8 millimeter, one millimeter is okay. We simply for measuring, we just simply wax the plant. We cut it. We take a cal caliper. First, we measure the wax uh, thickness uh, with the plant with the wax. We remove the wax, measure the stem, divide by two. You get how thick layer we have. First, I do it in the nursery always. Should I one millimeter? Then there's a big discussion in Scandinavia, and I think that the recommendation is because some people want to save some wax, we don't need it down on the root neck. We are planting deep, but. The insect can also go a little deep, so and if you get a wound down on the root neck, you certainly kill it. So, so we recommend to go from the root neck. I think Sandra, who is a big user, also does that from the root neck, and as high as you sort of the, the, the 30, the 60, 70 percent of the plant. And there's also a cost factor: <coughs> how much you actually want to use. Cooling is important. If I I set the plant strongly back, if I don't cool correctly. But if I cool, I'm okay. Control of wax cool control is okay. If I only wax without cooling, uh, mm -hmm. it's set back, but it will recover later on, but it sets it a little back. If I cool, I, I get recover. So we have to have control of your cooling. This is important. You have to know what you do. And we, today, as I said, we have worked a lot on the cooling thing. After some time, they will recover, except the one, these are the plants we saw in the last picture. After some time, they are similar, but uh, the one with uh, no a lot of hot wax without any cooling did not feel well. At what cost? And the general, uh, my general uh, comment is this: uh, machines, equipment, people. We say that the total cost per uh, plant should be a target. Is this? I, either I use uh, five grams or I use. 10 grams for wax, or maybe 12 grams. The price is this is euro cent, euro cent, sorry. Euro cent. I take 0.45 euro cent per gram of wax and I multiply with the um, number of grams I use. 5 grams, I would be 2.2, I think. Uh, euro cent. And then the machine investment is about 250,000 euro for a machine, production line. One cent if you divide it by uh, so how many working hours and five years or something. And you have some workers. So from five to nine euro cent per, per plant, this is the cost level. This is realistic. Yes. You have to accept or not accept? No, that, that actually, just to give some context, um, you would expect to pay at least 10 pence a plant for treatment with gazelle. Mm. So you're a uh, this is without this is the cost. I don't know what a nursery yeah, yeah. a nursery okay. man also has to have something. Yeah, yeah. Hundred <coughs> percent. <Sorry>. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is yeah. that's the, another discussion. These two thousand and eighteen figures. So. These are today, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm. yeah. The salary varies. You know, the salary hour in Estonia is three euro per uh, three euro per hour in Estonia. Yeah, in yeah. Sweden, it would be more than 16 euros. Yeah, and uh, <coughs> that includes your initial investment. Yeah, yeah. I, I say that. There are rough, there's a rough figures, yeah. but it, it should be possible to get it within this frame. Yeah. Where we, what we do today, I say, okay, Norway growing, 5 million plants this year, maybe three last year. Estonia, uh, so I think the sta uh, state, state forest is using 10 tons, and I think they are interesting, so it works. So three to five million in Norway. How many in Estonia? I don't know. Ten. I have. I ten said. I calculate tons. Ten tons last year. So <laughs> then you can calculate from there. Maybe two million, three million. Two, two five grams. Three million. Yeah. That's another calculation. But uh, it's it's they are looking, smelling. Does it work? Does it work? Yeah. Got some report locally. You have to do it always on your own fields. You have to know what to do. On the, uh, maybe something else in the UK. And, and there is it's a little different here in Scotland. It's a little different than Norway, we, uh, we admit that. There are more insects. <coughs> Scotland, we are, have been around here with uh, Christy Elite, and we are doing trialing here 
for three years. Uh, Sweden, as a market leader, has I think it's about 20 million at least a day. And Slovakia, some state forest buys some Tatra Mountains, some few tons. But th there are many users. Uh, I don't do the res research. I, this one is a little interesting, show what's happening in Sweden. Uh, the total plant production in Sweden, uh, on, only to 2014 because we stopped the project in 2015, but we say it's at 300 and something millions, conifers in Sweden. And you see the red line is the insecticide treatment. We started going down, as I said, in 2010, 2011, then everything started in Sweden. It's going down. And the green is the alternative coming up. And this, con this development continues. The green come up, red go down. And now in Med Forest, it's been forbidden in Scandinavia, as I understand. So, so the trend is positive now. It's, it, it is okay. You can, you can. I worked many years with this project because uh, there were some other owners. But uh, when you don't have a customer, you don't have a market. It's a little difficult. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. And then I'll show you a couple of films of machines. Should I where we are? Yeah. So, so one thing to to stress is that in oh, mainland sorry. Europe your machinery is fit for purpose. Your machinery in this country at Christie's Elite is fairly primitive. It's a, it's a step-in model, we say, the step-in model. We have a step-in model uh, from time for, I would think, 18,000 euro plug-in ready yeah, to so, use. So it's basically, if you think <coughs> scooter to BMW, the one we have in this country is scooter, the one they have in mainland Europe is BMW. Oh, so uh, not main, not uh, we are talking about, we are talking about Scandinavia. I don't think I don't main and Europe. Yet. This is a machine which is at the bee nursery. This is the AU machine which we developed, which is now, there's only two of them, but this one in the bee nursery in Norway, it, it holds nicely. We are going to put it up in a place where this year we are talking about this. Five, it does 5,000 plants per hour regularly in a few stops. You see the conveyor belt go around, the shower system, I'll see you see that later. This guy bought 25 tons of wax for this machine, so we are running. Here you see the screw. It's fascinating, I think. Yeah. You see the shower? Okay, this is a project financed by uh, Norwegian uh, Research Funding. Uh, participants are the University of Swansea with Professor Butt, <coughs> uh, University of Oslo, uh, Vikenskog is the biggest uh, player on the forest plantation in Norway, Bede Nursery is the biggest nursery in Norway. And we are looking for, rep we try to use repellents. We want to go for repellents uh, to s stop the, wax, the, the beetle from climbing over the wax. <coughs> because we have, we have realized we have 40% unprotected plant. We have 60% prote uh, protected, but 40 unprotected. <coughs> I just took this, uh, we were, uh, yesterday, Mar and I were uh, looking at the site. And there is a nice uh, lady bird sitting on the plant because it's non-toxic. It's a plant. It looks like this. It's a huge uh, clear cut. So this is up at Rothes. Yes. Weevil hellishness. Hellishness. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's true. <coughs> when we plant, control, 100% dead after one month. So I just go fast through. What happens is that when we wax the plants, we get problem with the top. The wax is okay, the top is not okay. It looks like this, over the wax. We planted it in 2016, we observed it one year after, but it's 50% of the dead of control, some recover, the root is still alive, so they recover. Uh, one one, one to nine percent dead wax, wax and repellent, a little different, uh, of, but uh, less than control at least. But not clear repellent effect, wax okay, repellent not okay. Then we did it again with another repellent, 
that was the same effect, same result. Uh, looks like this: the green uh, shooting from the wax, a new shoot coming out, but the top setback. Uh, but we had 97 percent. If, if you go to that side today, the, 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 the wax plants are okay; they live, but they are no tops. They're new tops. <coughs> I wanted to say what we were doing now. So this is a <laughs> because we say when you when you when you think about the insect, you think: I, Is there any brain or any inter intelligence in this insect, or is it completely stupid? Why? How could it survive in nature so long? It, it, it said it moves randomly, and then I took this. We, the idea came up: this uh, Eurisa Park. Eurisa Park. You know, the, the the insect is trapped in resin, yeah. rosin, stickiness. <coughs> Did the insect learn to stay away from that stickiness stuff? So what we did was to say, okay, let's go the stickiness way. Let's look at the, the rosin. What does it do? It's sticky. So we took uh, a strong adhesive, a hot metal adhesive, and we made uh, a small collar with the stickiness underneath. We had already studied that if I put it into a, jar, a small glass jar and I put stickiness around the surface, on the, at the entrance, it never got out. The, in, the pine needle stayed inside. It could not climb out, it could not pass. And when we, we had a, a, a small video camera filming and what happens, we see that the pine weevil comes to a sticky surface, it stops. The one foot is stuck, but it f then it has the strategy to get out of this situation. So, so that, that was a good idea. It works in the lab. You see, the, the, we have, this is the same chamber. The, one, the five hungry pie weavers, five days. The one, the one on the left is only wax. It's completely <coughs> gone on the top. The one on the right is quite okay. So we, we, let's do that in full scale. So we planted uh, this May in Rotes. No soil scarification, directly in the soil, without soil scarification. The toughest condition you can have. And look, that, the, 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 this small collar with a stickiness underneath. The so pine needle doesn't pass. So these are trees planted in <coughs> unlanded soil yeah. and weevil hellishness. Weevil hellishness. I mean, really, really devastation, weevil conditions. And Control is absolutely gone. Yeah. A long time ago. <coughs> gone, yeah. So we are optimistic about this new approach. And you are first in the world to hear about our new approach. <laughs> this, we, believe, we believe in Scotland to plant on tough conditions, you need the wax or coating and something added. And I think also Rodney will talk about that. We have to add some, because you are in worse situation than in Norway. Yes, because that's the criticism leveled at these alternatives is, oh yes, they work in Scandinavia, but we have more weevils in this country. Uh, we have, can have a long discussion about why that could be. Um, and all our presenters here acknowledge that. And this is why we've got them here today yeah. to say we do acknowledge this and this is what we are doing <coughs> to address the tougher conditions that we have in Scotland. And the only way that we've been able to do that is by working and working and working and moving forward. Whereas up until now people have said, oh it doesn't work, we've got more weevils, let's give up. These guys haven't given up, they've kept going, they've acknowledged we've got a worse problem here and they are addressing They got that. a project. Yeah, <laughs> they're addressing they got that funding, yeah. and but then they work and work, and then, yeah, and then I'm very optimistic about this, but it has to be, I mean, maybe the shape should be, maybe, maybe smaller, I don't know the, I don't know the optimal shape, could maybe be very small, it's only, just doesn't pass the sticky stuff, huh? mm -hmm. but you, we don't want to catch all the insects, because we are afraid of two things, first we are afraid of the, this is a, we printed only plastic things, it's the wrong material, we have to have a material which is acceptable. We cannot use plastic in the nature, and I think that's accepted. And then, of course, we were, sure, we're not uncertain if it will, how long will it stay sticky, but it's still sticky, so. Yeah, in May, we found 
one living control, 47 dead, completely dead, after one month. We found 31 of the wax, or 48 wax plants dead above wax, and only four of the 48 with the color of the wax. And we got what we call the synergy effect of wax and color. <coughs> Looks like this, huh? Today is yesterday. In hell. Yeah. <laughs> and as I look, and then he said, it, we had tapped a few, maybe a few small bugs, but not very much. But it sticks to everything, so uh, of course it's not so easy. And we are measuring. <coughs> we had some problems here. This one. It is not eaten by the insect. It's no scars of the hylobius. But we had an insect eating the needles. Huh? What is it? Nut leaf? Nut leaf? A different sort of leaf. No, some of the needles are gone. Yeah, some other insect has eaten that. So today it's some more attacks on the, on the, on the, over the coda, but 10 or 48 are still uh, are, are harvest over the, the over, but may survive. But uh, the 48 is gone. Clear, yeah, so strong effect, control, increased control, effect yeah. of the wax. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that is what I wanted to present. Brilliant, yeah. excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. So what I'm going to present is just, you know, the state of that as to where we are at Alder Trees with the, the non-use of chemical approach to weevil control. It's quite interesting with Yao because we, we, we actually haven't met before, but we're, very, we're extremely aware of the work you're doing and the work you've done in Norway, you know, in the development of wax has been really good. We, we tended, well, I didn't want to do, as we're investigating different options, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So we decided not to work with yourself, because you were working with Christy Elite. We decided to go down our own route and work with one or two other nurseries in Sweden and Denmark. Because I thought at the end of the day, I'm not bothered who wins the race in Weibo control, whether it's Alba Trees or Christy Elite. I'm very interested in just having a way of you know, controlling Weibo, you know, without the use of chemical. So if their ideas go in front of mine, I'm quite happy just then to partnership with them <laughs> or steal their ideas <laughs> you know so you know we're working in slightly different ways but we've both come to the same conclusion though that you can have a barrier but a barrier is only as good as what you barrier against that the plants we need them to continue growing and in all these systems the plant continue growing is not protected so we both come to the conclusion we have to solve that so i.e there's a bit above yeah, the barrier yeah. Technology? No, no, no. Sit down. Okay, so I won't, I won't make any excuses for a couple of sides of the company, all the trees, because you know I'm in business to sell trees. We pride ourselves as being a company which not only produces trees but we market what we do. We've always said that we provide trees and we provide a service to our customer. One of the services we provide at Alba is trying to solve the problems our customers, customers may have. And that can be anything from the control of weevil, red band needle blight, what other pests and diseases <coughs> what might come in our industry. It can be simple things like delivering your trees to the right place at the right time. It can be the correct provenance of tree you want, traceability, biosecurity. You know, we, we've prided ourselves in being a company that provides you know, a very good service <coughs> to our customers. So we are based out in East Lothian and we're over 115 million trees. And just in recent months, we've increased our capacity up to 18 million trees with the help of one or two grants from Brendan here through the grants and licensing. So we, we have extended our nursery with an extra with six million capacity. And that's our way of trying to respond to the increase in demand for trees through grant aid and forest in Scotland. Yeah. And my nursery is all cell grown. I don't do any bare root plants at all. And 
traceability and biosecurity. Yeah. So this is a little frame what we are all having to fight against. I would say that one thing I've always learned being a nurseryman is that you, you can't be in complete conflict with nature. If you're growing plants and you depend on horticulture or you know plants for your livelihood, you have to realise that you have to live with nature. You, you certainly can't eradicate nature completely. You know, so we're going to have to learn to live with this little beast. But I'm led to believe that the cost to forestry in Scotland is that we spend about four million pound on treatments and you know various you know different ways of trying to control it and. I think the latest statistic from the Forest Commission is it's causing about five million pounds worth of damage, which can that can be a reduction in density of plants in the establishment phase. So collectively we're talking about a, a nine million pound problem. I won't make any excuses for what we've done in the past or we're still doing right at the present moment. We do treat about two million trees a year. You know, our customers are demanding that we give them, in, you know, treated plants, and the chemical we're using at the present moment is we're using Gazelle. We have gone th over the years through products like Alert, Alert with Flexico. We then moved on to Merit until we realised that Merit was more persistent in the soil than it was in the plant. You know, we were told by buyer that Merrick was a better product because it was more persistent. What they didn't tell us is, was that it was more persistent in the soil, but Gazelle was more persistent in the plant. So our customers don't want Merrick sprayed plants from us. In the nursery, we're, we're running, well, we are the only nursery in Britain with uh, what we call a, a spray chase machine where we don't spray any of the trees out in the open environment. It's, there, it's in an area, an enclosed area, and all the spraying is done within a machine where the trees are they're ele elevated into the machine, it's all enclosed, they're sprayed, then they're brought out to a drying area. And we do respect our workforce and we try to keep the environmental harm to our workers as, as low as possible. We're not saying it's nil because we are still working with a hazardous product, but we have tried through the investment in machinery to make the spraying process in the nursery as safe as we possibly can make it. It's certainly a lot safer than actually the customer relying on spraying out in the field and all the hazards that brings and the, how, how prone spraying in, in the field is to weather conditions etc. So we kind of feel if you do have to have your trees sprayed then you're better to, to have it done in the nursery. However they also have to be sprayed in the field after a period no. of time. Uh, we, only, we only take away the first spray, yeah. which if you plant in the spring, that's the spring attack. There'll be very little of that chemical left for the next attack in the autumn or the next spring. You know, spraying out the fields, you <coughs> usually need about an 18 month protection window to get the plant to be big enough to withstand weevil attack. So the strategy within ALBA is we decided quite a number of years ago that we can't be completely reliant on the use of chemical. I would say that our industry has tended to take the approach that it needs to be reliant on the chemical. We, we decided quite a number of years ago for various factors that chemicals in the future may not be available to us. You know, that could be through public pressure, health and safety, new legislation. It could even be the chemical companies don't deem our industry as being a commercial market for the products because the amount of chemical used in forestry is quite small compared to agriculture. I'm not saying it's a lesser problem or anything, but I'm just saying for, for, for those companies to put the products through label approval for forestry, it might not be economic for them to do it. So we've always recognised that we need to work towards a non-chemical approach. And since 2004, we, we've embarked on that and we, we've actually spent a fair bit of our own money to do it. And as Jarl said, we're certainly not doing it to make our life easier in the nursery, you know, because some of the things <coughs> we've invested in are, you know, quite labour intensive, etc. Right. So 
the work we have done, I'll start off first of all from just talking about good establishment. The most important factor for you, whether you buy container plants or bare root plants, is go out and buy a decent plant. You know, you know, make sure you know you know the spec you want and the quality of plant. What what we say is one of the the first best approaches on the protection against weevil is to have plants which hit the ground running. You don't want plants going out and they sit there for a couple of years and they never move. You know, it's the one criticism I've got that in this country we've always said one of our best approaches to weevil control is to plant really big trees. Well, you find a really big tree can take quite a while to get established and get grown. You know, sometimes a smaller tree, if you could protect it, can during the same length of time it will grow and become the same size. You know, you know. So we say, you know, make sure you do everything you can in decent ground prep. We we say, you know, to give your plants fertilizer. The forestry industry is not that good at looking after the nutrition of plants. You know, the traditional method in Scotland was, you know, going to throw on some ground rock phosphate onto the, the hill. You know, we say there's much better fertilizers than that you can use. So our first approach would be do everything you can to get good establishment and get good early growth and make sure your plants hit, hit the ground running. After that, we, we looked, we went to, our first one we wanted to look at, instead of being a wax or any of those products, we looked for a physical barrier. So we, we actually went for what we called wee nets. And we, we first started wee, wee nets back in 2004. And that very simply is us in the nursery netting the root system and the, the top of the plant, right, you know, right up to the, the growth point of the plant. We, we you know, in the, the early years, we, we tried out different colours of net, we had red ones and white ones and everything. You know, but we, we found nets reasonably successful, but the, the kind of negative side was we were told it was only successful in white to medium attacks. There's the, the criticism that the net's a plastic material, you know, so, you know, do you want to use plastic in forestry? But we thought, well, we'll carry down that route because we did feel that the nets were quite photodegradable, you know, so they did break away after a, a number of years. We had other issues, people saying, oh, the roots won't get through the, the mesh and everything. But we certainly found that the, the trees survived having the net on them. And you can see from the right there that the roots had no problem of penetrating the net to, to get out. So nets back in 2009, we were doing over 600,000 a year. That, that's back at the year when they took Alert off the market. And everybody at that stage thought that chemicals were finished for use in forestry. So there was quite a panic in the industry for people to, to try out other things. But then, slowly over the years, the, the use of chemicals, obviously, they didn't ban the chemical at the time, or they banned that one, but then reduced the, the other ones. Then we've seen nets go down to the level where the arch is now, which is very small. You could be hypocritical of this and say people don't use them because they don't work. But we found that most people picked the, the cheaper alternative, which was the use of chemical. Yeah. We realised that, as Jarl was saying, that the net was only as good as, you know, like so your barrier, but it was only as good as the bit we actually protect. So we very quickly realised that one of the criticisms of the net was that the, the weevil just creeped up to the top of the net, then ate, ate the new growth. So we realised we had to try and create some physical barrier to stop the weevil <coughs> coming from the soil and up the plant. So we invented this barrier that you see here, and we, we wanted to use the barrier first without any net, and we thought we could put it on at ground level. So it prevented the weevil climbing up the plant. But we quickly realised that because of other vegetation, weed growth, the fat planters, if you put it at the very bottom, they'll just, they'll just bury it. So we quickly realised that we couldn't put the, the barrier at the very base of the plant because the insects could find, they bridged over other vegetation, etc. So we, we felt we still needed to put the net on the plant, then put the barrier at the top of the net. And the design... The, 
Aye. Initial results encouraging it. We we definitely had the same response, you know, the same findings as yourself that there was very little damage, you know, it did prevent the, the weevil climbing up. But your one, you you've adopted an approach to use a sticky <coughs> underside. The 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 one we done was we found the design of this here meant that the weevil found it very difficult to turn in that space. And once he tried to turn, some of his some of his feet came off the ground and the, the plastic on this bit here was of a certain roughness that the weevil's feet can't take a grip of it correctly. So the, the weevil actually fell off the barrier. Not going anywhere. Right. So, but the negative side to our barrier was that uh, first again it's made of plastic. You know, we fully realise that, you know, if, if we go through a process where we end up banning chemicals, well, we, there might be another phase after that where all plastic use in forestry is prohibited. So we are looking at alternative products to plastic, but we're also looking at different types of plastic. So just recently we've signed a, an agreement with Tubex. Tubex have seen this product and they're quite excited by it, that they see it being a design, they they seen the use of the smoothness of the plastic and the design of the lip. They they reckon they could control some other world pests and other horticultural products. So I, I think they're very keen on it for vine production. In there, where they're looking to a bigger model of this to put around vines. Just I don't know what insight it is, but some other insight they're Fine. trying to stop. Yeah. And it's not very clear for you, but you know <coughs> the way we worked out the smoothness and roughness. We worked with Glasgow University, where they looked, you know, at the feet. <coughs> that bottom left is the foot of the white of, of the weevil. Yeah. So the whole, you know, whole way that pro that thing works is the design of it and you know the smoothness. We didn't want to go down a a, a sticky route because we were worried that our forestry planting contractors, they wouldn't keep any clean. You know, that if we put a stick, sticky material on the bottom, we felt it might get covered up with the earth or dirt, you know, from hand container trees with the plugs on them. So that's the reason we didn't go down, you know, the, the, the sticky way of things. Yeah. And the other non-chemical options we looked at, we went to Sweden, you know, we, we've known nurseries in Sweden since the mid-80s, so we went to Sodra, one of the nurseries you mentioned. Uh, I put this down as wax, but I've just been told today that's not wax. <laughs> <laughs> but they do use wax in their bare root plants, yeah. but they use another product on their yeah. containers. Uh, I don't know if the audience is quite surprised that the development of non-chemical approach in these other countries is so advanced. Because what I hear from people is, I, I hear from people telling us, oh, we don't have alternatives. Well, there's, there's millions of trees being treated in other countries. And you get the proper support from the Lenham Institute, because they sound like they are, or the universities, are we getting the correct kind of partnership? Or? Well, we're getting no support at all. Yeah. Like, all, all the effort we've made so far has been off our own back, yeah. at our own expense. The, I don't know if anybody here from the Weevil Protection Group, but they've been invited. We, they haven't come. We <laughs> went to that group in the early days, and we, we we got told that the non-chemical approach wasn't a winner, so it's no point of even considering it. But we decided different to that. So this is the sort of things that are going on in Sweden. This picture here is the another barrier, which is a glue. Then they, they put a sand on the top. And that nursery's machinery is capable of doing about sixteen thousand every hour. You know, so <coughs> you know that nursery's turning about one hundred twenty million trees, and I think their non-chemical approach is to about sixty percent of those trees. So we're we're not talking about small scale in those countries. Mm -hmm. And one other one we're trying is actually with Bayer, the manufacturer of Merit. Bayer asked us to take on the development of their polymer product in Britain. They, they've, they've got one or two, they've got some trials going on in Sweden and Denmark, 
with polymer. So they've asked me to, to try polymer over here and try to see, see how it works. Again, what was shown before, you know, it can be quite complicated in the mechanical process uh, applying it. I haven't conserved my cell on the mechanical process. We have just very simply painting polymer onto the plant. The one thing I did, the one reason I was looking at polymer, which again has a negative thing to the fact it's a plastic, you know, I decided to look at alternatives to wax or sand because I was quite concerned about the heat process that that, that type of operation involves and the effect that has on the plant. So the, the polymer, the biggest problem Bayer was having with the polymer was trying to dry it quick enough. It's a cold process to put it on but it was taking them about eight hours for the polymer to dry. So when they tried to pack the trees, you couldn't separate them. But we did some work over here and we found uh, a solution. If you spray the polymer with a solution of calcium nitrate, that actually dries it within about 12 seconds. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's allowed us you know, to get to the point we can treat then pack within a reasonable amount of time. other side is biological control. You know, we realise the Forest Commission here are working on biological control. In the past, we've found that if we grow plants in containers, we've got a root plug on the plant. We've always thought that a good root plug is a good vehicle for carrying biological control. You know, in the past, we, we've inoculated root plugs with, you know, mycorrhizas or frankia. So we certainly see the opportunity if some type of nematodes or some other insect which is parasitic on the weevil, we've always felt that being a container nursery, we could play a part in the development of that type of thing. Yeah? Uh, you went on costs, I uh, agree with you Rachel, we, we estimate fuel <coughs> chemical spray with 10p a plant. Our wee net has been costing 12, wee net and the wee bar with the net about 20p. Decent fertilizer being put at the time of planting, three and a half pence, and the polymer we're just estimating it's just now about 17. So this is in year one, full chemical spray. That means your pre-treatment. You, that does not include your second or, or your third yeah, chemical spray. That is the cost of the chemical plus the cost of your labor plus the uncertainty of timing, availability of labour, weather conditions, and all the other things that can go wrong with subsequent chemical sprays. That is before you even put into the equation environmental damage, damage to contractor health, damage to private water supplies, or any other surrounding water. Hidden costs. What's the lifespan of the wee net in it's terms of how long is it? Uh, straight. Well, we, we had to make sure it didn't last too long because we didn't want it straggling. In the <coughs> yeah. So it's photodegradable over a couple of years. Right? Yeah. We, we, we've always thought you, you need to look for about 18 month protection. Three weevil attacks, 18 months, or up to stage where the plant's big enough to withstand it. Eh? But it's always about that type of time scale. Right? I've just put a few points the way we think going forward. My first point would be realisation that alternatives to chemicals, chemical control, that we do need to investigate. We need to take a more positive attitude to non-chemical approach. And if, you know, it may be that after a lot of investigation we find out that some of them are not suitable for British conditions, but at least get out, you know, at least get out there and evaluate them and see how we can adapt them for here. Because to turn around and criticise that waxes don't work or, or polymers don't work, well, we're only at a development stage. Eh? You know, as we develop products forwards, I think we can all put our heads together and, you know, I've heard them talk about wax, oh, it doesn't stretch enough. Okay, we'll solve that. Or you mechanically can't put it on. <coughs> well, I'm quite sure we can solve that. You know, so I think, you know, just to have the frame of mind that we do want to go forward, and I would say that that Fergus Ewan's press statement yesterday, I think, has shown that the mindset is changing, because that, that's the government now put out to the industry that they're willing to fund people looking at the non-chemical approach. 
and all my side criticism that would be pity that they do it back in 2004 when we first started, eh? but at least, you know, better late than never. Eh? <coughs> you know, so that, that was an announcement made just, just yesterday. Mm -hmm. So the, but they're not giving anybody much time to put in applications. <coughs> We've only got to October. Uh, so, you know, with that full review of current availability, you know, of, you know, let's go out and look at everything that's available. What we should do is look at other industries as well. Don't just look at forestry. You know, horticulture has plenty of problems with other insect pests and that. And horticulture has always looked at a very, you know, what we call integrated, you know, pest management. <coughs> but we look at all aspects of pest management from good crop hygiene to husbandry, ground conditions, everything. Don't just look at one part of what happens. You know, you need to look at, you know, every, every tool you've got available to you. And we need to gather that evidence and, you know, see it under mm -hmm. our conditions. Because we will be told that we will six times more here than it is in Sweden. Yeah, so what? Well, we've got six more of six more of them to kill, like, yeah. So, uh, and, you know, set up field trials. We've done a lot of field trials, but I really don't have the money and the expertise to monitor them correctly and everything. You know, it's very complicated getting a field trial out, making sure somebody goes back to test it, make sure it's properly replicated and everything. The way we work at Alba is, if we give it to a customer and the customer tells us it worked, that's, that tends to be okay for us. Like, uh, you know, we're very just almost you know, non-applied way of looking at things. Pragmatic, mm. it's called. Uh, I do think in the short term we should eliminate the need of <coughs> chemical spraying in the field. There may be a, a window where we need to continue allowing the nurseries to spray in the nursery, but I do think the hazards of spraying out in the field and even the, even the variability of it working, you know, with weather conditions and everything, you know, I do think we should work in the, in the short term to eradicate that. In the long term, yeah, let's get alternatives to chemicals, but in the short term, stop guys out in the field spray. Because what it does to your industry, you, you know, you've got enough problems in the forestry industry with people worrying about land use change and what's happening in the countryside and ground preps. You, you go and put a guy in a white suit and a respirator or a mask on and spraying it out in the field, <coughs> you're not going to get public support for the industry. So I, I think just for our own good PR, that we, we should be doing. Well, I did say, hi. <laughs> 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 mask. <laughs> uh, what we're concerned with as well in the short term is sometimes the, the chemicals very poorly applied. You know, sometimes the resources are not there, they haven't got mixed jobs or things like that. So, yeah. yeah, we're against chemical, but in the short term, we're also wanting to make more aware of the application. It's a difficult job yeah. walking across an extremely yeah. rough site with a 20 yeah. litre map yeah. yeah. You need to be, in Scottish weather, you need to be given multiple jobs to be able to react because you have to stop and start recording, and I don't think that's highlighted. People are forced into delivering no matter what. Well, you, if it rains, you just keep on spraying. Yeah, see that. Yeah, you have 12 guys sitting in a van, they jump out, they start spraying, it starts to rain, do you honestly think they're all going to go home? Yeah. Not going to happen. Yeah. My other point there is that, you know, I heard about nursing making life easy for me and all that sort of thing. We certainly don't do, do chemical control because it's a profit making centre. You know, we do it as a, a service to a customer. I may want to do it so the customer buys mattress, mm. but we certainly don't do it for the margin we make on you know, either spraying plants or any of these other treatments. So my thoughts here is that if we were, if we want to kind of emulate what they've done in Sweden, we have to realise that in Sweden, the nursery is owned by the forestry management companies or it's a cooperative of the forestry companies. So they've got themselves up to a scale where they can invest in capital equipment. Well, maybe we need to stop being so fragmented here and maybe bring, we could bring a few of the nurseries together and you know, maybe that we fund one centre for you know, the, you know, developing the, you know, the different approaches to VO control. Yeah. Just a, an idea of mine, but we tend not to be great at cooperating in this country. Eh? You know, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I see in, in Scandinavia we have all this lean on some university uh, environment. Mm. 
Yeah. In Norway, we lean on these people who worked with us in the AV project, mm -hmm. the nursery people trust them. Yeah. So you have to have somebody who works on measures and somebody, mm -hmm. these two people, <coughs> they do research on things, but they have the experience to, to how to measure things. Yeah. Also, Sweden was a good uh, land. Yeah. So the holy grail is developing a control method, as we said, lasts at least 18 months or three weevil attacks and <coughs> or until the tree is big enough. Eh? So, so that's where we are at Alba. You know, so we have put in quite a lot of effort in non-chemical approaching. Okay. Thank you.